Good morning. Welcome to Arts Plus Change, hosted by the University of Rochester's Institute for the Performing Arts in partnership with the Office of Equity and Inclusion, the Paul G. Burgett Intercultural Center, 540 West Main Incorporated, Create a Space Now, Eastman Institute for Music Leadership, the Warner School, and the Rochester Fringe Festival. My name is Missy Full smith and my pronouns are she, her, and I'm hosting this session today with monitor Jeanette Colby, and we would like to acknowledge with respect the Seneca Nation, known as the Great Hill People or Keepers of the Western Door of the Haudenosaunee. We take this opportunity to thank the original caretakers on whose ancestral lands, the University of Rochester, currently resides in what is now called Rochester, New York. As we come together, we also want to honor the many lives tragically taken too soon in recent events by acknowledging the need for commitment to constant action and attention surrounding systemic issues that continue to impact each of us to this day. While we have encouraged each presenter to make every effort to create a brave and safe space, we would like to encourage you to attend these sessions in the way that you need to attend. And while we know that discomfort allows for growth, we would like to remind you that you have agency to make decisions and keep you safe as we embark on potentially difficult content and discussions. As we are all here to learn and grow, we welcome you to challenge ideas, but we ask that you agree to challenge the idea and not the person. We also want to remind you that individual presenter views do not necessarily represent the official ideas or beliefs of the university, the institute, or its partners. In order to enable live transcription in your Zoom view, please click the arrow to the right of the live transcript box, and that box can be dragged to any location on your screen. We are recording today's session, so um, to protect your privacy, we invite you to rename your Zoom profile with your first name only and your pronouns if you feel comfortable. Any breakout rooms will not be recorded. And because we have back-to-back -back sessions scheduled, this will end promptly at the end time. And there will be a 15 minute uh, discussion of both presentations later on this morning. So uh, without further ado, thank you for joining us. And I am very honored to welcome Christine Stoddard. And um, she is presenting, what is the name of your uh, Uniting Poetics, that's right in front of me, and Humor in Post-Pandemic Art. So thanks so much for joining us this morning, Christine. It's all yours. Thank you, Missy. And that is quite the long list of affiliates. I had no idea. <laughs> I knew about the University of Rochester. And well, we grew, a, we grew a few, yeah, we grew a few partners this year, which is a great thing. Yeah, that, that is great. All right. Uh, so thank you for having me. Uh, Uniting Poetics and Humor in Post-Pandemic Art is the title of my presentation because I needed a title. Um, so hi, I'm Christine and I'm a writer, a director, an artist, a performer, and I'm based in Brooklyn. I have a very long bio on my website. I have some shorter bios. You can find out all that stuff at worldofchristinestoddard.com. Um, but basically I do a wide range of interdisciplinary work and most of it's narrative or storytelling based in some way. So what do I mean by poetics and what do I mean by humor? Um, humor, I think most people have some sense of, maybe they don't, they don't have a sense of humor, but they have a sense of understanding of what humor is. Poetics can be a little bit trickier. So the more literal definition would be the art of writing poetry thank you oxford languages and that would be writing verse right it's typically what most people would think of um but then of course there are plenty of debates about what poetry even is what can be a poem anything can be a poem a tweet can be a poem would be one side of the argument um the more formal side would be all about different structures and traditions um, and maybe prioritizing and privileging certain structures and traditions over others. For me, poetics is more about aesthetic and emotional language. So when I talk about poetics, that's what I'm talking about. I'm talking more about a vibe. Um, I think of heightened language, I think of imagery, I just think of beautiful, interesting wordplay, like 
painting with words, respecting words as a medium. Humor <laughs> um, is amusing, it's comedic, it makes us laugh, or at least it makes us smile, it brings us joy. Uh, so what I have been thinking about a lot during this pandemic or post-pandemic, I'll be talking about that in a moment, period, is the ways that I've brought or that I want to bring poetics and humor together in my work. Uh, so some people would ask, do humor and, and poetry even go together? Do they belong together? Some people would think, oh, well, these two things are totally at odds with each other. Like poetry is super serious. Um, it's, it's very heady uh, or all of the emotions attached to it, even if it's not about uh, serious thought, academic thought, intellectual things, philosophical things, emotionally, it's very serious, right? And then humor, especially in uh, academia, I have noticed, uh, not, not always, there are certainly exceptions, but it can be seen as frivolous and even unimportant, which bothers me, I will be honest, it does bother me. Um, I think that there are types of humor that uh, are offensive or unimportant or maybe just not needed, but I certainly wouldn't say that about humor overall. Just like I wouldn't say all poetry is melodramatic and people would, some people would reject it for that very reason. Oh, it's too serious. It's too much in this pretentious space. I wouldn't say that about poetry either. Um, certainly there is pretentious poetry and there are pretentious ways of delivering poetry, but that's not all poetry. So yeah, my simple answer is yes, poetry and humor do go together for sure. Uh, and humor heals. Um, there are so many discussions about the healing nature of poetry, um, again, like the less generous uh, thoughts about poetry would be that it's corny and that it's too touchy-feely. It's something uh, that maybe belongs on a, a super sentimental greeting card and not anywhere else if you're an everyday person who's not in an MFA creative writing program. Um, but I think, and, and I don't agree with any of those things necessarily. Again, I think there are some corny poems and uh, just like I think there are some pretentious poems. And I think uh, like I could just talk all about greeting card poetry. That's a genre in and of itself, or maybe not even a genre, more like a mode. Uh, and that mode is driven, driven by capitalism, right? Like the market decides what is going to sell because a greeting card is a product <laughs> at the end of the day it is a product um but I think humor can also be healing in the ways that poetry is often talked about as healing because there's something known as comic relief this is a term I think most adults are familiar with it's um, maybe not the specifics of it, but is, it is this idea that in literature, in theater, in different forms of storytelling, we do have these jokes or, or amusing incidents. We have, as Oxford Languages says, just gotta cite my sources, right? Comic episodes and a dramatic or literary work that offset more serious sections. Because in any form of storytelling, I believe, and I'm certainly not the first one to say this, I'm simply agreeing with it, that tension is very important. Uh, tension is important to any kind of literature or dramatic work, any kind of storytelling work. You want your reader or you want your audience member to wonder and to feel and to anticipate what's around the corner, what's coming next, what's going to happen in the story, or what's uh, 
what's the next conflict or what's the next joke? What's the next emotional beat that I'm supposed to feel? Um, and there's this ebb and flow that should be happening in any kind of form, uh, any form of storytelling. And humor can bring punctuation, that comic relief can bring punctuation to more dramatic works, more serious works. We have the serious, 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 and then something funny because too much serious gets to be too much. Um, and it's also not a reflection of life. If art is supposed to mimic life, well, life is not one note. We have so many things in life that are very heavy and difficult, but we also have so many things in life that are funny, amusing, things that are going to make us smile or laugh out loud or do something in between. Uh, so in my title, I talk about, uh, or I mentioned post-pandemic, right? So there's, of course, the question, are we actually post-pandemic? As somebody who actively has COVID, <laughs> as someone who took a home kit test last night for, I don't even know how many times in the past week, uh, yeah, I, I would say the pandemic is still happening, right? Like, I do not believe the pandemic is over. So why am I using this term post-pandemic? I am using it kind of to make fun of how often we see post used to describe movements in art and literature and thinking, uh, right? Post-modern, uh, post-internet, post-internet art. We see this over and over again, but I'm, also more seriously thinking about this difference that I've seen in art making since 2020. And again, I'm interdisciplinary. I'm thinking about art and storytelling very broadly. Um, but I, I see and I also feel. So it's uh, like an intellectual observation, but it's also just an emotional response to how I'm seeing different artists and writers and creators of all kinds uh, respond to the world. So in lockdown, uh, and I, again, I live in New York City, so my experience of the pandemic <laughs> would uh, be pretty heightened compared to what I've heard uh, some other parts of the country are experiencing, or even when I've gone back to my home state of Virginia the past couple times since 2020, uh, it does feel like not, not just another world, but like a whole other era, like a whole other historical period. It doesn't even feel like uh, the pandemic is there in some ways. Or, or has hit there in some ways. Like I remember being there in May, 2020. I had an artist residency. I was all by myself in an art gallery in Richmond, Virginia, um, like total isolation, wasn't allowed to have contact with anyone. The staff came by a couple times while I was there, but not while I was actively inside the gallery. We would coordinate it so that I would, uh, be outside like I would go down to the river or because that's what you do in Richmond you go to the river uh while they would come and retrieve a book or whatever it is they needed and we had this protocol that we had to follow about sanitizing uh everything right uh even if somebody even if a staff member came in for two minutes to grab a book before they left they had to ch -ch -ch spray everything down um, and, and still wear a mask while they were in the space because this was 2020. And that when I told other Virginians about that protocol, uh, they just thought it was so 
bizarre because this art gallery is a contemporary gallery. They have strong connections with New York and LA art scenes. They show a lot of art uh, by artists from those places. So that gallery was a lot more New York-y, is a lot more New York-y than the typical uh, Virginia art gallery, which shows like equestrian art from the 1700s. I'm not joking. <laughs> it's like typical Virginian art gallery, Thomas Jefferson, that kind of thing. Um, but when I was back home during that period, I remember going outside and not seeing people wear masks or I, I would, but just so sparingly. It would be like one person out of 50. I don't know. It was not that many people. Uh, and so many places were still open. And this was May, 2020. Comparing it to New York City, at that same time, just totally different. Uh, like in New York, it was a ghost town. Everything was closed, except for the essential businesses, right? Um, so in that period of art making, certainly in New York, everything was just so closed and so solitary and so monkish like I felt like I was in a monastery when I came back uh <laughs> not any offense toward people who live that kind of life but it was very different than the uh out all night kind of Bushwick lifestyle that I had before the pandemic um but then with the George Floyd protests there there was a shift. Suddenly people were going out. Um, there was this new era of protest art. And that like three month or two and a half month period of art making from spring 2020 was really over. And that's not to say that the pandemic was over. It's just suddenly people were starting to interact in person again and art making an art showing of different kinds was starting to happen in person again. Um, now we're at the stage where everything is hybrid. There are a lot of in-person events in New York again, but there are still plenty of Zoom events. And in many cases, an event will have both. They'll have some kind of in-person option and a virtual option. Maybe the virtual option occurs afterwards. Maybe you'll watch a recording of a play. Maybe you're not watching it live streamed, but there's still some way of experiencing that art, whatever the kind of art it is, in a virtual way. Uh, in I shouldn't say in all or even most cases, but definitely in many cases. And that's something that artists of all kinds have to consider here is uh, we are catering to audiences that might be with us in person or you know, maybe they're experiencing an art exhibition live in an art gallery, they're coming to the gallery, but maybe they are going through different Zoom rooms and seeing photographs or video clips of a physical gallery in New York City, but they're doing all of this from home. They're visiting the gallery from home. Uh, so when I that's all my long way of saying that when I talk about post-pandemic art, I am not saying that the pandemic is over. I'm just seeing these different stages. And maybe it would be more accurate to say post-lockdown. But even still, I feel like the art that was made in summer 2020, once the George Floyd protests began, uh, is different than the art that's being made now. I mean, we saw so many different creations that had some kind of Black Lives Matters theme attached to them in summer 2020. And of course, there's still that kind of art and that's that kind of messaging that's happening in art now, but it's not 
necessarily at the forefront of just about every kind of art that's being made and experienced and consumed. Okay, so for me, what was writing in quarantine like? Because for here, I am focusing on, uh, in this presentation, I'm focusing on writing uh, not necessarily as my only form of art making, but just um, it's been the place where I've brought in the most humor. Like I have brought in humor in some of my imagery, like in paintings and drawings. Um, and I've done some cartooning during this time too, but definitely uh, I think it's been most obvious in my creative writing work. So in spring 2020, I wrote this manuscript called Emails I Wish I Sent and Other Regrets. And I like to call it fever dream writing in quarantine because I really was one of those people who did not leave the apartment um, except when absolutely necessary. That was until I went to go do my residency in Virginia for two weeks. Um, but yeah, I mean, I remember one straight period of not leaving my apartment at all, um, except to go to the fire escape, which was still attached to my master bedroom window uh, for two and a half weeks. I had all my groceries delivered. Like I just... I was one of those people who was spraying everything down, which is why it's extra delightful that I have COVID now, two and a half years into this pandemic, because I had been so obsessive and so cautious. Um, and I guess in some ways it was inevitable, you could say. <laughs> uh, so with this manuscript of poems, these were all humorous poems, I ended up writing 75 pages total. A lot of it was stream of consciousness kind of writing that I didn't edit much at all during the process. It was only afterwards. And that tends to be my approach in general when writing. I will just vomit on the page uh, get it all out and then worry about editing it later instead of uh, obsessing over each and every sentence as I'm doing it. I prefer for the obsession to come in the actual editing process. And this manuscript was inspired by my frustration and I could say rage um, at these continued expectations for corporate communication norms during the early days of the pandemic. So I'm talking about things like, sorry for the delayed response to my email, which is this typical phrase that we see. It's this cultural norm, especially in the white collar world. Um, this idea that we're supposed to respond to an email within 24 hours, that if we haven't, or sometimes even less than that, depending on your industry and depending on the nature of the original message. Um, but in a pandemic, the focus should be on survival. It, it shouldn't be on when a PowerPoint is due or, uh, you know, preparing for a conference call. So that just made, that just made me very angry because in my real life, I was getting messages from clients. And yes, I was following up because I had to, I had bills to pay and I was fortunate that I could continue working during the pandemic not everyone was able to do that I get that uh but one of the one of the only reasons I think I was able to continue working during the pandemic was I succumbed uh much more than I wanted to to this pressure to just keep on with these communicative norms instead of resisting I resisted a little bit, but I realized that if I resisted completely, I would not be getting money and I need money to live. <laughs> it sounds obvious, uh, 
it should be obvious. I wish it weren't obvious. I wish we didn't live in a society structure that way, but that's the case. So one of the email, one of the emails, one of the poems uh, that came from that manuscript, I'll read an excerpt, uh, was sorry for the delayed response to your email. Sorry for the delayed response to your email. I just didn't feel like replying. Sorry for the delayed response to your email. I won't be sending any more emails to anyone ever again. To reach me, please throw pebbles at my window or do not attempt to contact me at all. Sorry for the delayed response to your email. I don't know if you heard, but email actually doesn't exist anymore. This message was made available via time travel. Your concerns have already been addressed in another dimension. Goodbye. So this is what the full poem looks like. So yeah, this previous one was not formatted um, according to the way I, I had it for the final poem. This is just a screenshot from the Word document. Um, but this, this poem, you know, I submitted it to the universe because that's what you do when you're a poet, unless you're Emily Dickinson, is you send submissions and you hope that one day um, someone actually cares about what you wrote. And this poem resonated with a lot of people. Uh, I received responses to it immediately uh, in, in different ways uh, for different outlets, different kinds of platforms. Um, the first one was in, you know, the traditional literary journal platform. I had Matt not accept it, and they do uh, focus on absurdist work and surrealist work, Dada work. Um, and the editor told me later that he just really loved the absurdity uh, of this email communication that I was talking about, that these norms that we have in place that are absurd, that people are dying and we still have to keep up with email if we are in this white collar world. Um, and then I had the chance to perform the poem uh, over Zoom, of course, at first, because that's how everything happened. <laughs> it was the era of Zoom readings in spring 2020 and early summer 2020, just Zoom, 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 since we weren't having in-person poetry readings at that time, at least in New York City. Um, and yeah, again, people just responded to how, to the same frustration and the same rage. And throughout the manuscript, throughout those 75 pages, I do use humor to express this frustration and rage because I could have just been angry. I could have just written 75 angry pages, but that would have lacked tension. That would not have captured humor as a coping mechanism. I tend to laugh a lot and I've dealt with some difficult things in life. Uh, as we all have, but I don't think I would still have the relatively sunny disposition that I have if it weren't for the fact that I have, since I was a kid, learned how to smile and laugh. Um, I can't be angry all the time. That's not productive. Um, I think there's also a lot of a lot to be said for the resistance that comes from joy and humor uh, that, hey, yeah, sometimes you do attract flies more with honey than vinegar, right? So in, let's see, in January, 2021, there was another project. Let's see, how, how much time does Christine have? Okay, Christine has enough time, just checking here. I realized I, in my COVID state, did not uh, bring my phone with me. <laughs> uh, all right, so another project was a chorus within her. So what was this? This was a commission that I received in January 
2021, Jen Clemens at Theater Alliance in Washington, D.C. called me up and she remembered me from other projects I had done in the D.C. area when I lived there. Um, I was the writer in residence at Woodlawn Plantation, which was the plantation of George Washington's uh, God, stepdaughter, somebody, George Washington, somebody. Uh, and it used to be part of the Mount Vernon plantation. Anyway, like another super serious place where I ended up making work that was in some ways serious, but also lighthearted, right? So Jen remembered me from that. She remembered me from some other things in DC. And she called me and she said, hey, I'm putting together a uh, a play for or a performance of some kind for Theater Alliance. And we are going to have a few different women playwrights. They're going to collaborate on something together. And it's all going to start with Zoom. So you all are going to meet on Zoom. You're going to talk about your quarantine experience, your pandemic life, um, the kind of art you've been making, how you've been coping with this period. And you're also going to interview different female leaders from the Washington DC area. Uh, so Jen had us talk to curators and professors and choreographers and teachers and scientists, all these different powerful, accomplished Washington women. And then we had to come up with our own writing. So we had to, from those discussions that we had together and from those interviews that ended up being discussions with these different powerful women in DC, we had to write poems. And these poems are going to form the basis of some kind of play or performance at Theater Alliance that would go on in fall 2021. So it did open in September 2021. When she contacted me in January 2021, she didn't really know what the timeline was going to be because nobody knew what the timeline for anything was going to be, especially in major cities where uh, COVID was still a big problem. Um, so we drafted these submissions, we exchanged them with each other. I should have mentioned the other wonderful women uh, who were involved. Uh, there was Gabrielle Freeman, Glennis Redman, and Carmen Wong, um, all different accomplished poets. And uh, a couple of them are multi-hyphenates too. Like I know Gabrielle Freeman does a lot of painting, for instance. Uh, Carmen Wong does a fair amount of activism and academic writing as well. She's doing her PhD um, at Penn State now in African-American studies. And Glennis Redman, I believe is primarily a poet, um, but I know she is a big collector of paintings and other kinds of visual art. So she has a great appreciation for other art forms. Uh, all right, so we exchanged our drafts, we gave each other feedback, and then based upon that feedback, we had to rewrite our submissions, our packets. And I think in total, each one of us was supposed to uh, produce like 15 to 20 pages of something. And these some things, these packets were all compiled into one packet. And then these poems were sent on to the creative team and the cast that Theater Alliance had assembled in DC. So all of the poets, all four of us had some kind of connection to Washington DC. Um, I am originally from Arlington, Virginia, which is a suburb of DC. Um, and that's where I lived for all of my childhood and my early adult life before I lived a couple other places. And um, I know Carmen had gone to Howard and Glennis was the artist in residence at the Kennedy Center. And Gabrielle had lived in DC and worked for the federal government for about a decade before she moved uh, down South. 
Uh, but the creative team was all in DC, all actively there or DC area, you know, including Maryland and Virginia. Um, and they had to create something based upon these poems. So during the draft exchange, I quickly noticed that uh, while I had some very poetic kind of work, uh, some deeply serious, meditative, philosophical kind of work, um, I thought that in this case where my strength lied was in humor because all of the work, all of the work that came in from the other poets was very serious um, and beautiful. Do not get me wrong, beautiful and lyrical and uh, just so moving. But I was thinking, how is this going to be on stage? And what is this going to be like for the audience to go through an hour and a half, a two hours of very heavy something when they're already actively living in a pandemic uh, and many people have suffered personal loss or at the very least know someone who knows someone who lost someone. We're gonna need some comic relief at some point, right? Um, so that's where I came in. So the, the creative cast and the crew ultimately decided that the piece based upon our poems was going to be a choreo poem, which if you are not familiar, that was originated by uh, in the play for colored girls who have considered suicide when the rainbow is enough. And it's a kind of performance, it's a kind of theater that unites all the different types of theater. So it has dance, it has uh, poetry, it has song, and it also has the visual elements that come with theater. Um, and I really like how Rory Dean described it on his blog, Above the Line, um, because he captures how it's not just dance and poetry, it's also a choreo poem is highly stylized and it's at times excessively melodramatic. It's a container for long-winded monologues, tangled metaphors and dream speak best heard than witnessed. I don't think that's necessarily a criticism, um, but yeah, this kind a choreo poem does tend to be very serious and tend to have a a very serious vibe uh, that can be transformative and important for the viewer, but it can also be a lot for an audience member. Uh, here are some images from how they ended up staging it. I did have a chance to go see uh, the second to last performance in Washington before it closed. We had a tremendous cast. So you, if you're not familiar with choreo poems, maybe the images give you a better sense of uh, how these kinds of plays can look. Uh, so this is all to say that I did, when I went to go revise my packet of poems, I decided I need to bring more humor in here. And that was something that came up during the Zoom conversations with the other poets, like, Christine, you're bringing the comic relief. Could you lean into that? Like the other three poets will take care of the more serious stuff. And they, they ended up keeping a couple of my serious poem, like super serious poems. But for the most part, I was there to bring in some humor about serious things that women were experiencing during the pandemic, like about uh, the way women are socialized to be excessively polite and accommodating in ways that men are not, again, to generalize, or 
the way that housework, there, there were all those studies, right, about how housework fell disproportionately on women during the pandemic, even though many middle class women were also still working during that time, uh, taking care of children or elderly or other needy relatives, relatives in need of, of help. Um, yeah, like feminism, labor issues, blah, 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 all that stuff came up in my poems. I just found funny ways, tongue in cheek ways, lighthearted ways to talk about those things and to come up with stories about those things. And that was something in the reviews of the show that kept coming up that, hey, this is a very serious performance, but there are punctuations in A Chorus Within Her, and those are coming from Christine's contributions. Um, we have funny stuff in here too. It's not all super, super serious. And I think, and I was told like that uh, was a necessary part of that play. Again, humor is healing, humor is a coping mechanism. Uh, so in 2021, I got the chance to return to the Broadway Comedy Club with plays and variety shows. And these, I mean, it's a comedy club, so everything's supposed to be funny. <laughs> Maybe not always laugh out loud funny, but at least, oh, that, that's going to make me smile. That's amusing. That's fun. Kind of funny. Uh, so like many people working in theater, I should say like everyone working in theater in New York City 2020, uh, was horrible. I had a lot of things cut off. I had a lot of things that just didn't happen, things that were contracted and contracts that uh, had to be revoked because theaters were closed. But the Broadway Comedy Club, once they reopened, did say, hey, come back. We like you. We can do this safely again. And I think uh, one of their saving graces was that they are a smaller venue. So they're, they're, they have two levels and one of their theaters, the main stage, um, or I, I'm sorry, the street level one, you know, that it can, that room can seat 75 people because it's cabaret style and they can squeeze in more tables and chairs. It's not a fixed seating arrangement, but it looks great with an audience of 20. Like you don't, you don't need to be crammed in there. In fact, I think it's better if you're not crammed in there and you can still have a good time. It doesn't uh, feel like you're in an empty room because you have a smaller audience. So there is a chance for people to spread out. Um, so I had all these plays that I was going to put on before the pandemic and I had to rewrite things. I had to acknowledge the pandemic in some way. And that's not to say that every play I put on in 2021 or in the earlier part of this year at the Broadway Comedy Club was a pandemic play, but usually there was at least one or two references in a play. Um, that I wouldn't have made before the pandemic, or I had to change the circumstances of the story. Like in Cyber Cinderella, which I wrote before the pandemic, uh, I rewrote it so that the ball took place over Zoom because they couldn't have a regular ball with social distancing, blah, blah, blah. Um, and there were other plays Forget fairy tales I had actually written a decade ago and just never had the opportunity to stage. Um, and it was the least pandemic-y of the, the plays that I staged uh, once I was given the chance to do that. Uh, but there's still bits in it that are pandemic-y. Like uh, there's this one uh, scene in there with a the toilet queen and she talks all about uh, etiquette, etiquette for using a public restroom. And there are references to social distancing and hygiene related to COVID in the scene that I did not have prior to the pandemic. 
Um, clowns and otters was, <laughs> I should just read the description to you because I don't even know how to summarize it otherwise. It's about an unlikely meeting between a clown and an unlikely meeting between a clown and an otter ensues. Clowns do have sex. And did you know that otters have a thing for baby seals? Bes besides their perverted sides, they share their philosophies and approaches to fun and play. A clown pimp and a couple of shock jocks also make appearances, but we won't spoil it. So in this play, um, the, the pandemic reference is, uh, there's actually no explicit mention of the pandemic, but what is, I think what is inherently pandemic-y about this play is the story's emphasis on play and relaxation and joy as a form of resistance because I think that is something that a lot of us uh really if we didn't think it before then started to cling to during quarantine like why uh why are we still working so hard when there's a pandemic going on like shouldn't we be appreciating life when people are dying like shouldn't this be a time when we really remember just how finite our time is here hashtag mountain girl had a bunch of different scenes in it um but all of them had to do with uh social media and digital communications in some ways so there are definitely references to zoom in this play for instance uh, and then the latest one was My Favorite Sex Toy, which was a conversation between a woman and her sex toy. And this I wrote this year. So I wrote it this year and it was staged this year, but I was definitely inspired by all of the talks people had about masturbation in this period and how dating had, uh, fell off for a period during the pandemic because of social distancing and people not, uh, being encouraged to see each other. Um, so second to last, almost done here. Let's see, time check. Okay. We're, yeah, we have about, it's uh, 10.33, about 12, 13 minutes. Okay, okay. all right, all right, thank you. <laughs> Should have brought my phone. Okay, so uh, Poet Voice Sucks. This uh, is my latest exploration at the Broadway Comedy Club. And this is a poetry series, but it's a funny poetry series. So the project, uh, I co-host and co-produce it with Jessa Powell, who's one of the actresses I work with at the Broadway Comedy Club. She's appeared in a few of my plays. Uh, and we invite writers, comedians, actors, or collaborative duos, like a, a poet, will work with an actor, a poet will write a funny poem, and then an actor will perform it. And so the poetry uh, really can take any form as long as it's funny in some way. So it should be lighthearted uh, at the very least. And I, I shouldn't say that humor is on a spectrum. It's more about individual taste, but yeah, I mean, some some of the poems are meant to make people chuckle a little bit and others are just hilarious. It's gonna make people wet their pants. So our tagline is that poetry is for everyone except for pretentious schmucks. And our first one was on May 22nd. We did get reinvited for July 24th and we are selling tickets now. So you are welcome to check it out. Um, I will say that on May 22nd, Thomas Fucoloro was our standing ovation slam poet. People just died with everything that he had to say. Um, I loved what Megan Meehan and Donna Morales did. Megan wrote a poem. She's a poet and a fiction writer. And then Donna, Moral Donna Morales, uh, who's a professional actress, actually performed the poem and that got and she had props too so here are some photos here's Thomas Fucoloro doing his thing and this is Donna uh performing Megan's poem and here's me with Jessapel full of enthusiasm 
All right, so now I am working on a play that's pretty darn serious. It's Mi Abuela, Queen of Nightmares. This was something that could have died with the pandemic, but thank goodness it did not. Um, it won a National Playwriting Prize in January 2020 and was supposed to be staged in June 2020. So you can see uh, what happened there. But now I'm fortunate enough through crowdfunding and private donations um, to get to put it on at the Gene Frankel Theater in NoHo uh, later this month. So it is a play um, about a young Salvadoran American and, uh, named Maya and she finds out about her family in so many ways. There's a lot of magic and folklore um, and the story revolves around mainly her relationship with her mother, uh, which is shaped so strongly by her mother's worship of her dead mother. And it touches on mixed race identity, fantasy as a coping mechanism, and there's also a lot of movement and some dance as well. And there are cacti, there are owls, there are jaguars. So this is a perfect example of a piece of mine that is quite serious, but it still has those punctuations of humor. Um, because again, I think comic relief is necessary. There's a reason why humor exists in every culture. What is considered funny in one culture may differ from what's considered funny in another, but humor does exist in every single culture. All right, and here is just one of my favorite photos that has come out of uh, putting together this play. Come see the show. But yeah, I'm happy to take any questions at this time. I do see things in the chat. So let me see. Oh yeah, someone wrote, totally agree that humor heals. Partly agree that humor heals, ah. Okay, yeah, I mean, the, it is controversial um, for sure because not all humor heals everyone. And it is important to be serious too. Uh, I think it's about balance. I think it's about knowing when to smile and knowing when to laugh and knowing when to cry. Uh, I don't think it should be all one or the other. And I, Again, that's why I think uh, I, I do love the idea that art mimics life uh, or should mimic life in many ways. It is a stylized version of life. It is a metaphorical interpretation of life. It's an extension of life. It's not literally life, but in life we do have, we have both. We have the serious and the humorous and art should reflect that. Yeah, and I'm, I'm happy to answer any other questions or respond to any other comments. Uh, otherwise, I'm so happy that you've been here with me this morning, uh, been here with me and my COVID self. <laughs> I appreciate it. I, Christina, I had a, uh, I kind of, you kind of answered the question just a little while ago, but sure. um, you were talking about um, solitary, you know, being alone and, and solitary during the pandemic. And, uh, and then there's all these different periods, you know, where we, there, there's people dying and then George yeah. Floyd. And of course, there's also that political divide that, you know, in the country, yeah. you know, and, and all that affects your mood and, um, you know, and, 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 you know, talking about like reading the room when you're like on, you know, you're, you're getting all this information, but as a writer, are you affected by that? Like, you're, you know, like, when you're writing your pieces or when, you know, sometimes is it hard to like channel humor or do you, like you said, do you balance it or do you have to like close everything off or what, what do you do? Yeah, I, I think it really depends. So I'm one of those people who tends to work on a few different projects at a time. So if something becomes too hard, for whatever reason, it's emotionally too hard, it's intellectually too hard, it's financially hard, like maybe I'm not able to produce it at this time, um, I'll just go to another project. And because my projects 
yeah, there are certain recurring themes, but they are pretty wide ranging. So if I just cannot work on one, I'll work on another and then I'll come back to something when I'm ready to go back to it. Um, I, I don't want to stop from creating ever, but definitely there have been points where I've had to stop working on a particular piece and then just circle back to it. Okay. Yeah. Well, that makes sense. Well, I'm here. I'm going to post the, the uh, schedule in the chat. If anybody wants to join in on then after this, it's about five minutes. So if there's any more questions for Christine. Christine, I was just going to thank you for, first of all, being here while you have COVID. <laughs> Secondly, um, just for sharing like your insight about humor, because I think sometimes people like it's not necessarily one or the other, like you can right. use humor, you know, humor to actually touch subjects that are really, really hard to talk about otherwise. Right. And I think yeah. sometimes people, you know, like I, in my own work, sometimes I, I, I was in a period where I would do things that had a lot of difficult content, but then I, I have shifted a bit and I'm kind of doing things that are like more beautiful. But to me, that is still um, in an, in a, for lack of a better word, activist place, because it's like, you know, like beauty in the midst of these other things like is necessary. It's as you yeah. said, healing and it, and it's also like celebrating the, the, the bodies, the people that we're working with. Right. And so I feel like that it's the same way with your work and, and humor. Like people are like, oh, we need Christine because she's the humorous one and we need that comic relief. But like, that's what allows us to digest all this stuff that's going on. Right. So anyway, I really appreciate your work and, and how you shared it today. Thank you. I appreciate being here and I appreciate you saying all that, Missy. <laughs> Thank you so much, um, Christine, uh, for, for your sharing. So um, I'm very interested in, um, in, I have a small question, small, small okay. question. My first question is, do you think the use of humor in the poetry is influenced by a person's character? Mm, because this, uh, if this person is a humor style and uh, this person may, uh, want to use humor in in your writing poem, and this is the first question. And uh, the second question is, how many times do you spend on writing poems a day, a week, a month, or a year? <laughs> I'm curious. Um, yeah. I'm curious the poem time. And the last one is, do you feel professional strategies should be learned for writing poem? Because um, I write a little bit poem in my daily life, but I'm definitely I'm not professional. I'm learning education. But when I, the first poem I write when I was in my pre, uh, elementary school, um, and it's a little, little small one. And I often write something when I have some feeling for the nature, or I like flower, or like cloud, or I like uh, or a breakup with relationship, I will want to express emotions, I will write something in, in the form of a poem. So I'm, but all of them come from my nature. Um, yeah, so I'm wondering whether the professional strategies should be learned for writing the poem or not. Um, yeah, that's a small. Okay, sure. Not really <laughs> so for, the, for the first question, I think for sure, uh, some people have a natural sense of humor and a, a natural ability to identify comedic moments. But I also think that humor can be developed um, and that there are different forms of humor. There are things that some people find funny or some cultures find funny and others do not. Um, so I wouldn't let uh, someone's natural humorous ability stop them in any way. If they're interested in developing that and exploring more, there's so much to read and so much to watch um, now more than ever. Thank you, internet. Uh, or maybe not thank you, like in some ways it's overwhelming. But <laughs> um, yeah, I, I think 
your character is going to influence what you write no matter what, whether it's in regards to humor or anything else, because our personal experiences, our viewpoints are what makes our, or what make our, our voice unique and what distinguishes one artist from another. But I think just about anyone should be willing to try just about anything as long as they're curious and are willing to fail in some ways. I, I think failure is a very important part of making art of any kind. You have to take risks and you have to just keep trying until something resonates with people and and res and you feel good about it too. Uh, you feel invested in it. Um, there was, I don't really remember the second question. I'm sorry. Oh, that que second question, how do you spend your time Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, the schedule yeah so <laughs> um that's a really hard question to answer because uh I spend every day making something is the simplest way to answer it I don't divide it in terms of my different kinds of making because again I am interdisciplinary um, I am driven by financial concerns too. I do have clients. I do have commissions. I have work that is expected of me. So there is a certain pressure to produce. Uh, mm -hmm. That is part of what keeps me alive. <laughs> I, have to, I have to say, uh, I'll just say that uh, time is up. Or yeah, it's okay. 47. So thank you so yeah, much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, take care. I appreciate it. Have a good day. Bye.